tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Creeps in this petty pace from day to day till the last syllable of recorded time and all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle, life but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets upon uh, his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Now that's the only Shakespeare you'll ever hear me quote probably on a Sunday morning. Not just because it's from Macbeth which is called the Scottish play how much more appropriate could it be? But also it's because it's the only Shakespeare I've ever read. Isn't that terrible? I am so uneducated. And the only reason I read it is because we had to at school to pass our English test. But it was a quote that really stuck in my mind when I read it all those years ago. It's a speech made by someone who has come to the conclusion that life just goes on and on and on. Day after day. But in the end, it doesn't really make any difference. In the end, it has no real significance. It has no real purpose. And of course, Shakespeare wasn't the first person to express this kind of feeling. In the Bible, King Solomon, David's son, expressed something similar. He wrote in the book of Ecclesiastes, meaningless Meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What does man gain from all his labour at which he toils under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. There is no remembrance of men of old. And even those who are yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow. I've seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless. Chasing after the wind. And to try to overcome his feelings of that meaningless, that emptiness of life, Solomon described in his book how he went looking for meaning, in pleasure, in undertaking great projects, in hard work, in wealth, in wisdom. And in a sense, he had it all. He built an amazing palace. He built the first temple in Jerusalem for God. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. If that's a good thing or not, I'm not sure. He was was also the richest and the wisest man on the planet at that time. But none of it satisfied his heart. None of it took away that sense of the meaninglessness of life. Other people have tried to do the same, of course. In the face of that nagging feeling of the the lack of meaning and purpose of life, people have reached for more and more. For example, Madonna is reportedly the best-selling female artist of all time. She's called the Queen of Pop. But despite all of this, this is what she said about herself in an interview with Vanity Fair. She said, I have an iron will and all of my will has been to conquer some horrible feeling of inadequacy. I push past one spell of it and discover myself as a special human being and then I get to another stage and think I'm mediocre and uninteresting. My drive in life is from this horrible feeling of being mediocre. And that's always pushing me. Because even though I've become somebody, I still have to prove that I am somebody. My struggle has never ended and it probably never will. So what can we do in the face of this problem? Do our lives really have any purpose and meaning? Was Macbeth right in describing it as a tale told by an idiot signifying nothing? Was Solomon right in saying that everything is meaningless? Was Madonna right in thinking 
that all we have to do is just keep on pushing and pushing and pushing, trying to make ourselves somebody, make our lives matter. Well, this morning, we're not going to listen anymore to Macbeth or Solomon or Madonna. But we are going to listen to God. And we're going to see what God says. So we're going to go right back to the beginning. Read from Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28. And Caroline is going to come. And she's going to read those verses to us this morning. Thank you, Caroline. Yeah. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image. In our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Thank you very much, Caroline, for reading this morning. If you brought a tablet today, not one of the ones you take in your mouth, but an Apple iPad or an Android equivalent, you could find many uses for it. You could use it as a a doorstop or as a, a name badge, a chopping board, a plate, or even as an alternative to bathroom scales. Wouldn't really advise it though, because it probably wouldn't work properly, would it? And it'd be a waste of its potential. To get the most out of that, you have to use it for what it was designed for. What it was made for. And it's the same with our lives. There are lots of things that we could do with our 70, 80 or whatever many years we have on this planet. Enjoy yourselves, make money, seek popularity, comfort, happiness, entertainment. But if we want our lives to work, if we want our lives to be all that they were supposed to be, then we need to discover what they were designed for. What we were made for. And for this, we have to listen to God. That's because, as you read in verse 27, God created man. We are not the product of random processes over billions of years, as some people try and tell us. Instead, we are the product of God's creativity and power. We were designed and made by God. This is what Jesus reiterated in his own teaching. He said in Mark chapter 10, At the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And so if we want the best life, we need to let God determine our purpose. We need to let God tell us what we are here for. And that's what this passage that Caroline read to us tells us. God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. We were all made in the image of God. Male and female alike. We were all made to resemble God. Now that doesn't mean that we are all identical to God. Of course there are many ways that God is is different from us. God alone is all powerful and all knowing and all present. Neither does it mean that God looks like us physically. Or that we look like God physically. Because God is not a physical being. In the passage that we read from last week, Jesus said that God is spirit. 
So we're not made in the image of God because we've got two eyes, two ears, you know, stand upright and all of that kind of stuff. But it means that in other ways, morally, spiritually, intellectually, emotionally, relationally, we've been made to resemble God. For example, we are morally accountable for our actions. We are called to live in holiness and righteousness. Why? Well, because we are called to mirror God's holiness. So Peter writes in 1 Peter 1 and 16, quoting God, he says, Be holy because I am holy. We are made to resemble God. But being made in the image of God also means that we can uniquely relate to God. If we had time, we could read through the rest of Genesis chapter 1, and we would see that in day 5, for example, God blessed the animals that he made. But in day 6, he didn't just bless human beings, he also spoke directly to them. God blessed them and said to them. As God's image bearers, we've been made to listen to God. To communicate with Him. To live in a relationship with Him. That's at the very core of what life is all about. This is what Jesus said in a prayer in John chapter 17. He said, this is eternal life. This is life to the full. This is abundant life. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Real life is defined by being in relationship with God. Not just knowing about God, but knowing Him personally, intimately. But we're not just able to relate to God, of course. We're able to relate to each other. In a way that resembles God. In a way that resembles God in His capacity to loving and faithful relationships. So, for example, Paul says in Ephesians 5, Be imitators of God, therefore as dearly loved children, and live a life of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. As we were thinking about this morning in our time of communion, Jesus' love for us and dying for, the, on, for us on the cross, that's supposed to be the kind of love that we express in our everyday lives as we relate to each other. Not just for those who like us or are nice to us, but as we talked about at communion, as God demonstrates his love for us while we were still sinners. We're called to express that love even to those who hurt us or ridicule us or attack us. So we're called to resemble God and we're called to relate to God. But then thirdly, we're also called to be like him in reproducing his image. This is the the first of the two commandments in the passage that we read. Verse 28, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth. It is one of the, the purposes of marriage. To produce children and then also to provide a family in which they would be cared for and nurtured. And this has been fulfilled as the 7.8 billion people or so in this world all came from the very first couple. This is what Paul declared in, in the city of Athens. He said, from one man, God, he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. This means all the the prejudice and pride over race and ethnicity is completely pointless. Because folks, we're all one family. We're all related to each other. We're all cousins. 
distant cousins. <laughs> but of course, not everybody wants to or has the privilege of having kids. Does that mean that we can't apply that command? We can't live out that command? Well, no, because there's a deeper aspect to that command. The Apostle Paul, he was a single guy. And yet he called Timothy my true son in the faith. Timothy was fruitful. Because he, Timothy was his spiritual child as he had discipled him in his walk with Christ. And so this is our mission. Whatever our life situation Jesus has called us as his followers to go and make disciples of of all nations. To go and to reproduce God's image by pointing people to Jesus. And helping them to grow in their faith. That's how we all can be involved in being fruitful and increasing in number, whatever situation of, of life we're in. But then the second commandment that we read in verse 28 was not only to fill the earth, but also to subdue it. To rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Now this does not mean that we have the right to use and abuse this world for our own selfish wants. Neither does it excuse cruelty to animals, or a disregard for the impact that we have on our environment. In fact, it's the exact opposite of this. As God's image bearers, we are called to represent God's rule on this earth. We are called to take responsibility of leadership in this world. We're called to care for this world and its inhabitants because that's what God does. The Lord is righteous and loving. Righteous in all His ways and loving towards all He has made. And then as we do all of of this, ultimately we're called to reflect God's glory. We were made to to glorify, to declare, to display, to demonstrate how amazing our God is. That's our ultimate purpose. In Isaiah 43, 7, God speaks of everyone who has who is who has is called by my name, whom I created for my glory whom I formed and made. Why did God make us? For His glory. Maybe that's why at the end of this chapter that we read in Genesis chapter 1 it says that God saw all that He'd made and it was very good. Now at the end of all the other five days of creation God said it was good. But here, at the end of day six, after making us as human beings, God said it was very good. Because God was especially pleased that as human beings we could reflect His character and His glory. We are really the the pinnacle of God's creation. Because we have this ability, this call to more accurately reflect who God really is. And how great God is. And so this should be our greatest ambition in life. You want to write out your, your life's ambition? Then this would be a good place to start. Whatever you do, do it all. For the glory of God. 
Whatever you do, whatever situation we are in life, whether we're kids at, at, at school or at college or we've got a job or we're retired, whether we've got a really active life or whether we're, we're not as active as we used to be able to be, whatever you're doing, whether we're stuck at home or whether we're out and doing things in the world, whatever we're doing, do it all for the glory of God. Honour God with our lives. That means that nothing that we do is ever insignificant. It adds value to even the mundane, the everyday things that we might do in our lives. Do the dishes for God's glory. Cut the grass for God's glory. Do your job, not just for the wage packet, but for God's glory. Look after the people next door for God's glory. Just be thankful every day for what God has given us for His glory. As God's image bearers, we have been given this amazing purpose in life. To resemble God. To relate to God and to others. To reproduce His image. To represent His rule. And ultimately to celebrate God's goodness. And reflect His glory. But if that is God's original design, then why do we struggle with this this feeling, this sense that our lives are empty and meaningless? Why then do we feel that just every day just goes on and on and on? Why do we feel that we have to drive ourselves and push ourselves to seek meaning and possessions or, or achievements or popularity? If we've been given this purpose, why do we struggle so much to live it out? Well, it's because we've failed to live as God has called us to. As Paul writes in Romans 3.23, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have rebelled against the God who made us and we have demanded our own way. This is my life and I'll use it any way I want, we've said. So we'll fail to resemble God in His moral purity. Our thinking has become warped and distorted. Our attitudes and actions towards each other are often so unloving. We have messed up this world. And we don't reflect God's glory. And this feeling of emptiness is a direct result of turning our back on God. Listen to what the prophet Jeremiah says in in Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 13. Quoting God he says, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water. And they've dug their own cisterns. Broken cisterns that cannot hold water. We've turned away from the only one who could truly satisfy our souls. And we've turned to stuff that can never, ever meet our deepest needs. So I just want to show you a little video clip now. It's a testimony, another testimony from what's the story, uh, of a guy called Brian. As he experienced that sense of emptiness, and he searched to fill that, but the how Jesus rescued him. It's the stability of knowing God, knowing that I am loved by my Creator, and knowing that, that nothing, nothing, nothing can take that away. My name is Brian Davis. I live on the west coast of Ireland in County Clare. So I grew up in Dublin. Um, I did all my schooling in Dublin, moved over from America uh, when I was five. And um, I did a little, uh, like an art portfolio course, um, which I I loved. I loved to create. Um, But unfortunately, I couldn't continue 
get into all the, the next level of our colleges because I didn't have a leave, leaving cert. But from there, uh, because I couldn't get into the art college, I actually I spent a year just playing piano and um, was drowning my sorrows, uh, you know, in, in just soaking into the piano and I would play nine hours obsessively every day. After the Irish music, I got right into um, uh, alternative healing. Uh, and then from there, <laughs> it sounds crazy, but in my life is mad. I was a chef for a while as well. I've done it, you know, every kind of job I've done it and from building sites to chef work to uh, selling sunglasses to, you know, I, I just uh, I had a mad life. I, I lived in Australia then for five years as well. And I was practicing the, the alternative therapies over there. Um, I came back to Ireland again and then um, it was there that I, I uh, opened up a, 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 an alternative uh, therapy center and I was teaching uh, this uh, different spiritual uh, techniques and different different ways of you know different uh, healing techniques and all these kind of stuff and and I had a spiritual bookshop as well uh, on top of that um, and I sold every spiritual book uh, under the sun through my life I've been searching searching for God for fulfillment from from the the art, the jazz music, the Irish music, the alternative therapies, the healing, and all that spirituality, all that. Uh, I guess, though, um, when it came to my my own kind of um, uh, point of healing, you know, who was going to heal the healer, uh, and uh, um, uh, you know that everything just kind of came crashing down. moments and I know a lot of people have had those moments and I just everything was just shattered and that's when uh, I called out to God of the Bible and uh, much to my shock he answered uh, I, he led me to uh, looking through all looking for this answers through all my spiritual books I mean I had a ton of them and I was looking through them all and, and all the, the the oracle books and and from the angel cards, to the I Ching's, to all these tarots, to everything, I, I, I had them all. And, and I wasn't getting the answer there. Uh, and then I opened up, um, I thought, well, maybe, you know, God of the Bible. And I opened up the Bible, which was um, my friend's Bible, not my own. I didn't sell that in my shop. And, um, and sure enough, uh, I found the passage in it, and it was a story. God loves story. He loves to take us through stories and he invites us into his story. There, there's a story that Jesus tells about, about a man who finds treasure uh, in a field. Uh, and he finds it and then he hides it. And he goes off and he sells everything he has in order to, to, uh, to buy uh, this field so he would own this treasure. Uh, and this is what Jesus was describing. The kingdom of heaven is like that. I found that like, that's so true. Like to know God, it's like the most important treasure. And later on in, in my walk with the Lord, there's another verse that, 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 that really spoke to me. It was um, about God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Uh, I remember one time really, you know, this is uh, after a year or two of, of, of being a Christian and following after him and we have our ups and downs and that but I remember I was just really diligently seeking I was taking this verse and he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him and I, I remember just with all every part of my being just shouting out and, and wanting more of God and surrendering it all to God uh, and then I really vividly uh, I, I got the reward I got the reward and, and the reward for me was that he was seeking me really like really wants to 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 know me uh, and that that was my reward that was that's all i needed to know and that has a massive impact changes everything everything uh, if we start from there that's the core of your being that that god uh, wants to know you god wants to know us god wanted to know me 
and this love for me that nothing that the world can, can, can take away, um, that nothing can, can come in between that, and then you just enjoy uh, the presence of God for the rest of your life as much as you want, and seeking Him more and more, and then realizing He's seeking you more and more, and it goes on and on and on, and uh, it just gets better and better. Throughout my life, I had sought uh, fulfillment for my creativity, only to find true fulfillment in my creator. And so this is the good news for us. Instead of giving up on us, letting us go our own way, God sent His Son to seek for us. He is the only human being who's ever perfectly fulfilled God's purpose for Him. We read this, this verse a few months ago about God, the Son, or about Jesus. The Son is the radiance of God's glory. The exact representation of His being. Only Jesus could say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And as the perfect human being, He went to the cross where He bore our sins. Our rebellion, our shame, and he died in our place. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So if we put our trust in Jesus, then we are brought into a personal relationship with God. The relationship that we were made for. We're given a brand new life. We are made a brand new creation. And then we can rediscover our original design and our purpose as the bearers of God's image. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we are God's workmanship, His masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And then as we follow Jesus and allow Him to lead us and guide us in our lives, then through the power of the Holy Spirit, He will make us more and more like Jesus. Help us to step into the person that we were always designed to be. Because we are being transformed into His likeness with ever increasing glory. And then one day, when Jesus comes back, this process of transformation will be complete. Because when He appears, We shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. Then God's purpose and plan for humanity will be fulfilled. Then we will glorify God perfectly. As we bear His image. As His adopted sons and daughters. So Macbeth, Solomon, Madonna... And many others were not right. Our lives are not meaningless. Our our lives are not insignificant. We don't need to drive ourselves to try to become somebody. We just need to accept who we already are. We've been designed and created for a wonderful purpose. As God's image bearers, we have the awesome privilege to resemble God, to relate to God and to others, to reproduce God's image, to represent God's rule, and to reflect God's glory. I know we've been messed all that up through our sin. If we trust in Jesus, we can be restored. And as we wait for that day when God's purpose in our lives will be finally, perfectly fulfilled, we can live every day in relationship with God and to the glory of God.